when you think I am all that he created. And that is that you will be in the shadow. Sometimes you have to hear a thing. Hello everyone, I'm Alicia Hart and welcome to Live Your Journey. This week's journey, Vancouver, British Columbia, right in Canada. You guessed it, downtown on the harbor front. There's planes flying in and out on the water. It's absolutely stunningly gorgeous and the infamous Stanley Park right over my shoulder. We're gonna journey today. God's gonna be fabulous in Canada. He's fabulous in Africa. He's fabulous in Australia. He's fabulous all around the world and he's present everywhere at all times. Shall we do this everybody? Come on, let's journey in Canada. Have you ever asked yourself or somewhere, someone else, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? What am I doing here? Where is here? I don't know. What am I doing here? What? What am I doing here? Yeah, because if we're uh, faith people, then uh, we're people that also trust what the Lord says. I'm going to say that again. If we're faith people, then we're people that trust what the Word says, what the Father says, what the Word uh, says about us, right? Right? Hebrews 11 correlates those two perfectly and beautifully. Trust and faith, Right? It's a correlation that, that's, that's beautiful, and you almost don't see the difference between the two. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things that are not seen. Then the writer says, let me give you some examples, right? He, he says, consider Abel, consider Enoch, consider uh, Noah, consider Abraham, consider Sarah. Beautiful examples of ordinary Ordinary people who lived extraordinary lives. Miraculous, extraordinary people in the Bible. Jesus took 12 of them on a little journey. Come on. And they had, you know, issues. They were ordinary. Judas had commitment issues. Come on. They, they had issues. They weren't exempt. Thomas had some doubting issues. Peter had a little bit of ADHD. Come on. They were ordinary people. They were fishermen, many of them. Many of them, they were so ordinary, we don't really even hear their names or who they are. Stories about them. But I tell you what, Peter and all his ADHD-isms can come be my friend any time. I tell you, you know what? Because if I'm standing before the enemy, I want somebody that's willing to pull out a sword and cut off an ear. That's called, I got your back. The scripture says that Peter and John were unschooled. They're unschooled. They, they didn't have a lot of uh, uh, degrees hanging around. They, they, they didn't have a lot of uh, knowledge, you know, in terms of this and that. But you know what? They knew the Savior. And they had faith. Come on, faith that could move some things. Faith that could take care of some things. Faith that can shift some things. And, and, and that's all that they needed. They didn't need to be part of the society hierarchy or anything like that. They needed, didn't need a BA or a master's or a PhD. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with that. Get as much as you can get. Come on, get wisdom, get knowledge, get knowledge, get understanding, right? Right, but, but, but God is saying, I can use whoever I want. Whatever you possess and wherever you live and whatever and who you're married to and whoever you're related to, I can use. Then the writer says something that's very interesting, and I want to tell you more about what characterized their lifestyle. Let's turn to Hebrews 11 and look at verse 13. Is this good? Amen. 
1113. These all died in faith. Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. The English Standard Version reads it like this. These all died in faith, not having received the things promised, but having seen them and greeted them from afar, and having acknowledged that they were strangers and exiles on the earth. Here's what I want you to see. I want you to see that they all died where? In faith. In faith. They all died in faith. While living, I have to believe, because if they died in faith, I have to believe that while they lived, they lived in faith. Come on. I have to believe that, that, that when I pass away, if I pass away in a certain state, that I had to be living that way prior to departing. If I'm an alcoholic and when I die, they see that there's all sorts of stuff in my genes and in my, because I've been drinking, that I was an alcoholic. And when I died, come on, there was proof of that. Do, do you see what I'm saying? And so it says they all died in faith, which tells me that they had to have lived in faith as well. Amen. They acknowledged that they were strangers in exile here on the earth. I'm in this world, but I'm not. Come on. I live here, but I'm not of it here. I dwell here, but I live in faith. And they chose to live in faith. And so they passed in faith. Do we believe that or do we look at the things that we see and do we complain about them and do we grumble about them and look at our lives and see what, what's happening and we're, we're just grumbling and we're like, yeah, yeah. You know, we really believe that heaven is real, but really where we live is in time and space. We really live right here. Heaven's real, maybe at a certain point, maybe someday, or yes, definitely someday. But as far as what I'm concerned, as far as what's going on in my life, I'm living right here, right now in time and in space. And that's very scary. It's a scary place because that's not eternal thinking. No, I I'm living right here, right now. And, I'm, I I and that's what's profound to me. What's happening this week? What's happening next month? What's happening next year? The things that I'm striving for. While all that is good and fine and well, how does that fit into eternity? See, because this period of time is this long, and eternity I don't have enough room for. Yeah. Eternity is far longer. But God is so good to us. He helps us with our mindsets. Because we do need help, don't we? Yeah. He gives us scriptures and, and all of those things, and then he just keeps on going from where we were. We were reading verse 13, and then he says in verse 14, for those who say such things declare plainly that they seek the homeland. So what he's saying is those that, that, that live that way declare, I believe I was created for eternity. I believe that eternity is my ultimate uh, destination. I believe that eternity is for me and God created me to do what I do here and then eventually will be face to face in eternity. Uh, and they declare that they seek the homeland, but I ask you this morning, where is your homeland? Where is your homeland? Where is your motherland? Where is your homeland? Where is your homeland? Better yet, what are you doing here? First Kings 19, verse 1, And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done, also how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me and more also, if I do not make your life as the life of your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he arose and ran for his life and went to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah. Somebody say praise. praise. 
and left his servant there. But he himself went on a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die. Who are we talking about? Elijah. Did y'all hear what I just said? And he prayed that he might die. Mm, somebody say Elijah's just ordinary. He's just an ordinary person. And he prayed that he might die and said, it is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. Then as he lay and slept under a broom tree, suddenly an angel touched him and said to him, arise and eat. Then he looked, and there by his head was a cake baked on coals and a jar of water. So he ate and drank and lay down again. And the angel of the Lord came back a second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, because the journey is too great for you. So he arose and ate and drank, and he went in the strength of the food 40 days and 40 nights as far as Herb and the, uh, Herb, the mountain of God. And there he went into a cave. Somebody said, Elijah went into a cave, y'all. I didn't hear the y'all. Spent the night... In that place, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him, and he said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Oh, come on, yeah, we're gonna go somewhere now. He said, What are you doing here, Elijah? Now, let's talk a bit about Elijah. We know Elijah is an awesome man of God. He is one of the major, not minor, prophets. Come on. He's done miracle after miracle after miracle. Come on. The Lord told him to go to Brook Cherith. He went to Brook Cherith. What happened there? The raven sustained him. He, he ate off of the brook, or from the ravens and drank from the brook. He was sustained, which was miraculous, right? Then he went to King Ahab and he said, guess what? There's going to be a huge drought in the land. Just so you know, there's going to be no water. Just a heads up. Just a heads up. There's going to be a drought. And then he, he uh, raised the widow woman's son. Come on. He's bad. The widow, widow woman's son was raised by the power of God that lives in him. Come on. Yeah. And then there was the war, the big showdown between the prophets of Baal. Oh, the stage was set. Come on. There were 450 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of Ashura. These were all demonic warriors that worshiped Jezebel. And he called all of them out. He said, meet me up here. And oh, by the way, Israel, you come too because you need to see what's about to go down. Come on. And it was just him. It was just, he was the lone person. He was just an ordinary guy. And what did he tell him? He said, you guys go ahead and get some bulls. We're going to make an altar and we're going to sacrifice some things. Okay. You, you, you get your stuff. I'll get my stuff. And then guess what? You'll call upon the name of your God. And I'll call upon the name of the Lord, capital L, and the God who answers by fire, he is God. Yeah. Now you have to have a little bit of backing in your back pocket to talk big stuff like that. And you've called an audience to watch? Oh, you have to know that you know something. Come on, Samuel, you have to know that you know that God is God when you say, you bring all your folks, and by the way, get all the people in Omaha, tell them to come check this out. That's what he did. He said, you get them all, and guess what? You could even go first. Yeah. And so they, they, they cut up the, the sacrifice, and they put them on the altar. Oh, yeah. And they began to cry out to their God. And so the scripture says they started cutting themselves and doing all sorts of irrational of the devil sort of stuff because they thought, hmm, this is surely going to get our God's attention. We're showing our God we're desperate. We're showing our God we'll do anything. I wonder what would happen if we were that desperate for Jesus. 
I wonder what would happen if we were so desperate. We didn't have to cut ourselves. He would never let us get to that place. But if we were so desperate running after him and seeking his faith, I wonder what might just shift in your life. I wonder what might just change in your life. And so then he finally said to Ray, enough is enough. Enough is enough of this ridiculousness. Enough of this. He said, okay, let me get this altar that you guys have creeped out. Let me get my stuff together. In fact, let me get some stones. I'm going to get about 12 of them from the, representing the tribe of Jacob or Israel. I'm going to put them around them. And then, uh, guess what? Can you get me four big jugs of water? Somebody give me some water. Um, I need some water. And here's what I want to do. I want you to pour the water all over the sacrifice. I want you to, I want, first let me dig a trench. Let me dig a trench around the sacrifice. And then you bring that water, and then I want you to pour all that water all over the sacrifice because just in case somebody thinks I'm trying to pull a trick, just in case somebody thinks, um, and, and they may want to think that I'm doing something under uh, the cover or underground, just in case, I'm going to make this stuff so damp and wet that it could be nothing, nothing, nothing but the power of God when this thing catches on fire. Come on. And so he doused that thing. There was water everywhere. The trenches were full. Everything, the, the sacrifice, everything was soaked with water. And then he said this. He said, Lord God, of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Mm. <laughs> Prove to these people on this day that you're God. Show them that you're God, that I'm your servant, and that you are my God. Show them so that you can bring all of their hearts back to you. That's all he said. That's all he said. Real simple. He wasn't, ah, nothing. Real simple. All of a sudden, the Bible says fire came down from heaven. It said fire came down. It said it burnt the sacrifice. It burnt the stones. You know you're bad when you're burning stones. Burned the stones. It said it licked up the water even. Come on, somebody. It didn't leave anything to chance. This was Elijah. This was that ordinary guy. And then after all that, as if that wasn't enough, I'm stirring somebody's faith in here. As if what God has done for you wasn't enough. Then he goes back to Ahab and he says, okay, it's been three and a half years. Let me get up to Mount Carmel. I'm going to go. I'm going to put my head between my knees. I'm going to call forth water. You just get ready. It's about to rain. And what happened? It says there was a cloud the size of a man's hand that came out. And then pretty soon it rained. And what did Elijah tell him? There will not be any rain except at my word. It had not rained for three and a half years. But he told King Ahab, you go, you eat, you drink. Because I hear the sound of abundance of rain. Amen. And so this was Elijah. Sister Mitchell, he was bad. He was bad. This was Elijah. But I'm here to tell somebody that even... In the place where we look at man and, and see that he seemed extraordinary, we can turn to the very next chapter and be reminded that he's just ordinary. Whenever we settle for mediocre things in life, he, he's going to ask us, what are you doing here? Yeah. Whenever we decide that this much is good enough, he's going to say, what are you doing here? Whenever we decide, I'm just going to stop right here, he's going to say, well, what are you doing here? Whenever we decide that, that that's all that it's going to be, he's going to ask you, what are you doing here? 
What are you doing here? And then he tells Elijah to do this. Verse, 10, or verse 11. He says, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. Another translation says, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. See, wherever you go, God's going to find you. He's going to find you. This isn't a threat. It's a promise. It's a promise. And when he comes to pass by you, don't just stand there. You better follow him. Come on. When he comes to go past you, don't just stand there and be like, hey, what's up? You need to follow him. When we run from God's purpose, we're running from his presence. Yeah. Don't be surprised if in your fear and weaknesses, he starts to challenge you. He starts to challenge you in that place. For the same God that has come to heal you will also lead you back into battle. Here it is right here. Let's go to verse 15. This is where the rubber meets the road. Then the Lord said to him, go return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. See, there are times when we're called to move forward. And the worst thing that we can do is retreat. The worst thing that we can do is retreat. God wants us to move forward. There are times that it's going to require courage of us. Because what does he tell him? He says, I need you to turn around and go back. Back into the very thing that's caused you grief. Come on. He's just come out of that. He's hiding. God says, I want you to go back. Sometimes God will call us to go back so that we really can go forward. This is it. The very thing that you have not been willing to look in the eyes, to deal with, you lost this. This left you. You haven't been willing to deal with it. In fact, when it's brought up, you shut down, you go into the cave. The very thing you think you're healed from, you think you've moved beyond. But when someone pokes it, when someone blows on it, when, uh, uh, when a song comes on, when you're driving down the street, that very thing sends you to the cave. And you hide there. You retreat there because you haven't dealt. And God says, Elijah, you better get your hips out of that cave and go back the way you came. You go back the way that thing that scared you, that thing that tormented you, that thing that you've been running from, that thing that you have not been willing to deal with. I want you to go back that way. You go deal with it. Go return. Go back the way you came. Mm -hmm. Scripture says there was a great wind. There was an earthquake. There was a fire. What did Elijah say? He wasn't in any of that. He was in that still, small voice. Because here's the thing as I close. The only way for Elijah to advance was for him to go back and deal with that very thing. God's saying, where are you? What have you not dealt with? Because that's the very thing that's keeping you from moving forward. It's the very thing. You keep wanting to get ahead. You keep praying. You're fasting. You've asked me, you seek my face, you see other people getting it. Uh-oh. You have to try to pull back your emotions so you don't get jealous, so you don't get mad, so you don't get frustrated. You want to rejoice with them, but something in your heart of hearts, and God is saying to you today, come out of your cave and go back the way you came. Go deal with it. Go deal with it. Because until you do, the only way Elijah could move forward was to go back and finish what was left 
incomplete. It was incomplete. All of that stuff that he ran from. He had to go and step into a dark place to bring the light of God's presence for God to transform us. Sometimes God desires to reveal himself in the choices that we've made. Yeah. And if we run from the battle, then it's hard for God to win the battle for us. If we run from the battle, how can God flex and win the battle for us? How can we testify of his greatness? How can we testify? How, if I would have said, I'm just not going to preach today, how could I testify that he is a healer? If I run from it, instead of running into it and turning around, and God will take it and propel me further than I had ever been from the very beginning. Well, I sincerely hope you've enjoyed today's show. Oh my goodness, look how loud. Hey, take a look at that. There's a plane right now just landing, and that's what you hear, that loud noise. Wow, look at that beautiful scenery. That's North Vancouver right over my shoulder. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed everything here in Canada. The awesome thing is that no matter where we go, we get to see the faithfulness of God. Did you hear that testimony? He never lets us down. He's faithful at all times, and we're so grateful. If you don't know him as Lord and Savior, let's pray real quick, shall we? Father, we thank you for all those that say, you know what, I want him as my Lord and Savior. I believe that God sent his son Jesus. He walked the face of the earth. He died on the cross, and he rose again on the third day so that I could be saved and I am saved I am born again in Jesus mighty name amen and amen come here Micah say hello to everybody hello tell everybody don't forget live your journey we'll see you real soon thank you hardly seems adequate enough it's because of you, our friends and partners, that this worldwide ministry is possible. Together we are providing shelter to the homeless, food for the hungry, supplying practical needs to the poor, and spreading Christ's message of love and hope. Please contact us at AliciaHart.com to learn more about linking arms with us, share your prayer request, or to simply find out more about our mission. Again, we thank you for reaching the world with us as we spread the gospel of Jesus Christ.